In 1982, MGM released an animated feature called The Secret of Nim. It was the directorial debut of Don Bluth, who went on to direct such classics as All Dogs Go to Heaven, The Land Before Time, and Anastasia. The film was only a moderate success in theaters, but it did better in the home video market, where it was praised for the originality of its story, the quality of the animation, and the mature way that it dealt with the subject matter. The movie was actually based on a 1971 children's book called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, which was written by Robert C. O'Brien and winner of the Newbery Medal. Much less well known, however, were the actual experiments at the National Institutes of Mental Health, the Nim, that inspired both the book and the movie, which were important experiments in the field of overpopulation. And they were intimately related to the fears and culture of the time. John B. Calhoun and his experiments with the real Rats of Nim are history that deserves to be remembered. John B. Calhoun was born on May 11, 1917, in Elkton, Tennessee, the third of five children. He became interested in birds in junior high and published his first paper at the age of 15 in The Migrant, the Journal of the Tennessee Ornithological Society. While in college, he spent the summers working under Alexander Wetmore, assistant secretary at the Smithsonian. Calhoun's thesis was about the 24-hour rhythms of the Norway rat. He continued his work with rats with the Rodent Ecology Project at Johns Hopkins University. In 1947, he began an experiment with Norway rats in a 10,000 square foot outdoor enclosure. Norway rats can mate at any time during the year, have between 3 and 12 litters a year, and between 4 and 20 pups in a litter. In short order, the rats should have been able to multiply into thousands. Instead, the population stabilized at around 150 rats, who grouped themselves into small groups of about a dozen rats each. This early study apparently piqued his interest, both into rats and into their population dynamics. One of the driving themes behind Calhoun's work was overpopulation and increasing urbanization. For most of human history, population remained small, below 250 million people, and dispersed in small rural communities. Concern about overpopulation stretches back into antiquity. The Christian author Tertullian in the 2nd century AD said, Our numbers are burdensome to the world, which can hardly support us. The population reached 1 billion in 1804, and during the 19th century, Thomas Malthus introduced his fears that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power of the earth to produce sustenance for man. Population growth accelerated into the 20th century, doubling to 2 billion in 1927 and 3 billion in 1959. Medical advancements in the 20th century promised to accelerate it even further. In 1954, Calhoun was hired by the National Institute of Health and began working with the Laboratory of Psychology under the National Institute of Mental Health. This is when he began his rodent experiments in earnest, and it was where he refined his thinking about rodent populations and their connections to human society. His first experiments were set up on the second floor of a large barn, so full of rodents that it was said to take some time for newcomers to be able to uh, breathe normally. For this series of experiments, Calhoun built four chambers in a square grid. Ramps connected chamber 1 to 2, chamber 2 to 3, and chamber 3 to 4, but there was no ramp connecting chamber 1 and 4. Each chamber was designed to support a dozen Norway rats, and he provided a limitless amount of food, water, and nesting material. Into this rat utopia, he released between 32 and 56 rats, free to do virtually anything, limited only by space. As the rat population grew, so too did their social dysfunction. Quickly, small groups of rats took over the two chambers that had only one entrance, while most of the population was corralled into the two central chambers, quickly becoming overcrowded. Stress on the rats increased, and they began exhibiting extreme symptoms. Violence grew in frequency, and some rats became cannibals. Female rats were unable to carry their litters to term or abandon them at birth, and at its worst, infant mortality reached 96%. Many of the rats became hypersexual, and then later antisocial. Calhoun coined a term for this societal breakdown, Behavioral sink. What was more disturbing was that after the experience, the rats never again were able to re-enter society and recover. They remained scarred for the rest of their lives, even when reintroduced to healthy rat populations. Calhoun didn't publish anything about the study until 1962, but he clearly saw the lessons in the rat studies as a warning for the consequences of growing urbanization and the stresses brought on by increased social interaction in cramped spaces. Space and our relationship to it was one of Calhoun's main interests. He saw his early rat experiments to be a dire warning of what would happen to humanity without a compassionate revolution, fearing that society would descend into stagnation and death. 
His first study, and the term it coined, behavioral sink, came at a time when growing fears of crowding and overpopulation were just reaching a critical point in the mainstream. His paper became one of those rare pieces of scientific scholarship, tapped into the cultural zeitgeist and brought Calhoun's work a life of its own. Fears about overpopulation were already becoming rampant in the public imagination. In 1948, William Bach published his best-selling book, Road to Survival, which helped to popularize a kind of apocalyptic environmentalism, and in a similar vein to Malthus, emphasized the caring capacity of the planet and the risks of overtaxing it. The study itself became one of the most cited papers in urban sociology and psychology, and was included in the book, 40 Studies That Changed Psychology. The social ills of the time, rioting, violence, and social degeneration, all mapped easily from Calhoun's studies of rodents and allowed his work to catalyze quickly in the public imagination. Calhoun thought of crowding as a kind of social pathology that could be studied and that mice, while very different from humans, shared a need for certain social structures to ensure their mental health. Though mice have much more simple structures, the interruption of them could be understood on both scales and the effects compared. Calhoun continued his studies in a new location in the early 1960s at a rural property that Nim had acquired in Maryland. Though his work on rats had become famous, it was work at this site and its creation of mouse universes that would become his most famous work. In 1968, he introduced four pairs of mice to the universe that would become his most famous, Universe 25. For the first 300 days, the population doubled every 55 days, and by day 315 had reached 620 mice. That was when the mouse utopia started to become a mouse hell. Like with the rats, some male mice became outcasts, were often violently attacked, and they in turn violently attacked their fellow outcasts. Other male mice stopped defending brooding mothers, who became abandoning their young and attacking them or throwing them out before they were finished weaning. Increased infant mortality and the breakdown of society brought on by, among other things, the lack of space and the inability for younger males to immigrate to other colonies slowed the growth rate of Universe 25. The last surviving pup was born on day 600, but by that time deaths were already outnumbering births, after day 600, no young survived at all. While some of the mice would survive for another thousand days, the colony was by then reproductively dead, and no member of the group ever reinitiated any growth. By then, the surviving mice were well past their reproductive life anyway. Though the universe had been designed to house over 3,800 mice, the population only reached 2,200 before it began its precipitous downfall. Calhoun suggests that this came from an interruption of social interaction, which by day 315 was being routinely interrupted and youths were being thrown into society before they had reached maturity. Unable to properly learn or engage in traditional mouse courtship, the female mice largely stopped breeding. While some of the male mice were engaged in serious violence, the subset neither mated nor engaged in any kind of fighting. Calhoun and his team dubbed these mice, who spend most of their time eating, drinking, sleeping, and grooming, the beautiful ones. These non-breeding male and female mice were what was left by the time the older others grew old but they remained disinterested in breeding through their reproductive ages. Even when introduced to other mice who had grown up in normal circumstances, the mice from Universe 25 remained socially stunted. Calhoun's conclusion related this to the plight of modern man. If opportunities for role fulfillment fall far short of the demand by those capable of filling roles and having expectancies to do so, only violence and disruption of social organization can follow. Calhoun was not the only author speaking in such apocalyptic terms. While Calhoun was conducting the Universe 25 experiment, Stanford University professor Paul Ehrlich and his wife Anne published the best-selling book, The Population Bomb. Its first lines read, The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. The book would have a massive effect all over the world on public policy. Critics of both Calhoun and Ehrlich said that their studies and works focused on the wrong problem and that the primary issue was one of distribution and use of resources, not overpopulation. A reader of Orwell and H.G. Wells, Calhoun couched his studies in the dire words of fiction authors. In his opening to the paper on Universe 25, he wrote, I shall largely speak of mice, but my thoughts are on man, on healing, on life, and its evolution. Threatening life and evolution are the two deaths death of the spirit, and death of the body. His reference to two deaths goes back to the Bible, and he goes on to quote from the book of Revelations. But despite being associated with the macabre and pessimistic view of the future, his hopes were for healing, especially healing for what he called the first death, or the death of the human spirit. In the 1960s, he helped form an informal group called the Space Cadets, which met specifically to deal with the social uses of space. 
One of the things he had learned from the odd behavior of some of the mice was that in their attempts to cope, they changed how they used the space around them, convincing him that people could counter some of the negative effects of crowding. This was an expansion of what the space cadets would call conceptual space, a space in which humans could de-stress when faced with the normal social pressures of their actual physical space. It was Calhoun's penchant for science fiction, metaphor, and literature that would tie him so closely in the public mind to the pessimistic future, and thus tie much of his career to the criticism that targeted just how similar mice and humans really were, and whether their behavior could be compared. During the 1960s, Jonathan Friedman studied high school and college stu students and how they performed tasks in rooms with crowds of them, and found that the crowding had no effect on the performances of his test subjects. This, he and others would claim, meant that while animals were incapacitated by crowding, human beings could cope. Others argued that it wasn't merely density at all that Calhoun was researching, but crowding. Not a simple measurement of people per foot, but a study of the more subjective experience of social stress. Both of these concepts sparked much more research in fields as far afield as public health and architecture. His studies also served as a basis for proxemics, the study of the human use of space. It was Calhoun's, and in turn, the space cadet's its main interest. How space could be manipulated, even on the level of city design, to affect and improve human health. Calhoun left NIM in the 1980s, but he did continue doing his work. Passed away in 1995 at the age of 78. And by then, his work had become part of the national consciousness through several works of fiction, most notably Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of NIM, and the movie based on that book, The Secret of NIM. O'Brien's daughter wrote two sequels to her father's book, and there has been some talk recently of doing a remake of the film. In one of the meetings of the space cadets, Calhoun synthesized not the pessimism of the future imagined by his experiments, but in the path forward he saw to overcome it. Our success in being human has so far derived from our honoring deviance more than tradition. Template changing always has gained a slight, though often tenuous, lead over template obeying. But of course, the biggest difference between mice and rats and humans is the human brain, our capacity for creativity, for ingenuity, for compassion. Calhoun believed that it was these traits that would rescue humanity, but it would take effort, real effort, and a compassionate drive to make society work. Calhoun's experiments continue to inspire both scientists and artists, and they remind us that our future unlike rats in a maze, is ours to make whatever we wish it to be. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.